well uh, and of course safe uh, and want to make sure uh, that you are um, getting the, the answers and information you need today. We, we do have a presentation designed, but we'll try to be answering questions throughout the presentation uh, as well. Um, so to formally kick things off, uh, I'd like to introduce a few folks that will be welcoming you and, and speaking to a few items uh, tonight. And first, I uh, would like to introduce Nicole Lang, uh, our Associate Vice President uh, for University Engagement and Protocol and the Interim Associate Vice President uh, for Alumni uh, alumni Relations. Uh, Nicole, welcome. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Uh, I am excited to kick off the Gator Parent and Family Forum, the first ever at San Francisco State University. And as Chris mentioned, I am the Associate Vice President for University Engagement and Protocol and the Interim Associate Vice President for Alumni Relations. I've been working at SF State for six years now, and I am also a proud alumna. The Alumni Relations team is working hard to engage families and supporters, of students in a more substantial way. And we invite you to think of yourselves as part of the Gator family. As part of this effort and in collaboration with Student Affairs and Enrollment Management, we are launching the Parent and Family Forum. This will be the first in a series and will be a platform to answer your questions and to hear from campus leaders. Following the for tonight's forum, you'll receive a survey where you can let us know what other issues or questions you'd like for us to answer in the future. SF State has a strong legacy. I'll bet there are a lot of people on the call right now who are fellow Gators and who are excited to watch this generation start their higher ed journey. It's amazing that multiple generations are getting their education here at SF State and building whole families of alumni. Your students first day looks a lot different than my first day at SF State. The challenges they are facing are unprecedented, and we are all impressed with their resilience and strength. Their life journey will be different, which is great. We love different at SF State, but different doesn't mean alone. We are all here to help them and you succeed. We hope you enjoy tonight's program. Welcome to SF State and go Gators. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, of course, great to see you um, and, and thank you for your kind words. Uh, next, I would, I would like to introduce, uh, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Beth Helwig, uh, the Interim Vice President of Student Affairs and Enrollment Management. Uh, Beth, it's, it's great to see you, welcome. Thank you so much, Chris. It's such an honor to be with all of you tonight. I can tell you my heart is racing a little bit. I so wish we were in person with one another uh, to be able to welcome our students to the beginning of the year, but virtual is pretty wonderful as well. I would first like to start by thanking all the parents and family members, guardians of our students. Uh, I too am a parent of two uh, individuals who went through the collegiate experience and I know what it takes uh, from the time your child is born and all the way from kindergarten through, through um, high school. Uh, what it takes is a lot of effort and work. And we're so happy that you encouraged your student to consider going to school and that you chose San Francisco State University. Uh, this is my first year. I just completed my first year here at San Francisco State. And in that time, I wanna tell you uh, that I've discovered this to be an amazing place, the campus, uh, the community of San Francisco. I think we have extraordinary faculty members who are truly engaged with our students, incredible staff members who spend so much time with the student outside the classroom, and our student body is really special. Uh, in my short time, I've gotten a chance to know many of the students, and especially the student leaders who are so committed to social justice and this is uh, about being inclusive in our campus community. We wanna make sure that every student feels like they have a home here at San Francisco State. And we want them to know that um, no matter what their background is, they are welcome here and we, we are excited to have them. Uh, this summer during new student orientation, I had a chance to talk with all the incoming students whenever I have a chance to speak. And we have got some incredible incoming students and that in large part is due to you and their family members helping them to get here as well. We're very excited that they chose this campus and what I think that you will 
find out about us is that um, this is a place where people truly care about the students. And as they're on their journey uh, to get a collegiate degree, we want them to know that there are people along the path that are here in case they run into any problems and uh, that they have people that are really going to be looking out for them. And we so want family members to feel like this is part of your experience as well. Um, when we get back face to face, and we hope that happens sooner than later, we hope to see all of you on the campus attending our events and our programs and ultimately coming to commencement. And that will be such an achievement for you and for your students. So with that, welcome. I hope you have a wonderful evening. I think you're going to meet some great people. And thank you for choosing San Francisco State. Go Gators! Thank you, Beth. Um, always great to hear from you. Appreciate you being here. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Fred Smith, uh, our Assistant Vice President for Equity and Community Inclusion. Fred, great to see you as always. Um, the mic's all yours. Great. Thank you, um, Dr. Helwig. Thank you, Chris. And good evening, Gators and families. I hope you're doing well on this evening, the evening before first day of courses at San Francisco State University. So um, I am Frederick Smith, he, him, his pronouns, and I serve as the Assistant Vice President for Equity and Community Inclusion. And I'm sure some of you may wonder, what is equity? What is community inclusion? Well, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our area and how you and um, your families can get involved with us. So equity community inclusion consists of a series of student resource centers and student life areas that are all focused on identity and mattering and belonging. Our areas include an Asian American and Pacific Islander student services, Black Unity Center, AB 540 Dream Resource Center, Interfaith Programs, Latinx Student Services, and LGBTQ Student Life. We have a great professional staff um, including names like Arlene, Lassie, Tarshell, Brianna, Bucket, Christian, Luis, and me. And we are all part of the Student Affairs and Enrollment Management family at San Francisco State. Um, in a few seconds, once I'm done presenting, I will drop all of our social media handles into the chat and you can copy, paste, and add us um, if you happen to have another device or a phone by you. Um, feel free to add us right away. So equity community inclusion is responsible for leading, implementing, and evaluating a broad range of programs and initiatives and events and activities that are really related to facilitate intercultural and intergroup dialogue, promote equity and inclusion, advance social justice, and finally improve campus climate for all of our students, staff, and faculty. Ultimately, our role is to make sure that students, staff, and faculty feel welcomed, validated, and provided with all the support they need to succeed academically and socially at San Francisco State. And especially for our student scholars, um, we work in collaboration with our faculty partners to ensure that, that, that um, students can receive and earn their degrees in a timely fashion. Um, we're a really great space on campus, but virtually we're going to be active as well. As soon as I drop our website and social media handles, you'll have access to all of our centers, which have a host of welcome events happening during the first and second weeks and throughout the whole semester, um, and a number of other social, fun, academic, um, and identity-based programs to really get um, young people thinking about what are some of the issues happening in the world and society, how does it impact them as um, young people in the world, and how can we make a change and make sure that the world and our campus is a better place for everyone. I want to thank you for your time um, today, and I look forward to meeting all of you very soon. Um, thank you, and have a great evening. Thank you, Fred. Uh, appreciate you being here as well. Um, folks, I uh, just again want to thank you all for being here uh, from just some of the few resources that you heard from our guests uh, just a moment ago. A lot of that information will be shared uh, via the chat uh, and some items I'll discuss tonight in the presentation. And then of course, uh, your, your student gets a lot of information sent to them directly via their SF State email account. So we encourage that they're diligent and 
uh, checking their email and, and staying on top of things there. So I uh, just want to make sure that uh, you know that all the information that you hear tonight, we're going to put all this into a recorded presentation that you can have access to later. And we'll also PDF uh, the slides, which you can download from uh, the university's website in the near future. So we'll keep you posted on that. I was combing through some of the questions. I'm gonna do my best to respond to um, sort of the diversity of questions that are going through, but I'm confident that some will be uh, addressed in, in the presentation here. Uh, but again, I, I do wanna take a moment to introduce myself. My name is Chris Trudell. I use he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I'm the Interim Assistant Dean of Students, and my main focus uh, is around new students and first year experience. Uh, and tonight, uh, we're gonna talk through a variety of kind of very broad and some very specific uh, topics. And, and some might seem like common sense or some might be completely new to you. And, and honestly, the range is okay. Um, I really want you to leave tonight with just some new ideas and some new perspectives, but if anything, more tools uh, in your toolbox and supporting your student. Uh, if your student's here with you tonight, that's fantastic. I like to have those vulnerable and open conversations about how we're best working together and how we can support the success of earning a degree. So all of this really is a, a really kind of a united effort. Uh, but what I want to kind of go through tonight are these five main points. Uh, one, I sort of tagline uh, a beautiful balance, which is talking about challenge and support both at the university setting uh, as well as maybe at home uh, and, and through direct support with your student. Another piece will be called Starting Strong, which we're gonna look at some very important tips that a lot of new students either overlook or sometimes find a little more difficult to get started with. Uh, the next topic will be essential student services. These are some that a lot of our families and parents tend to ask or want to know more about, so I'll do my best to kind of unpack some of those more complex services and resources available to a student. And then next, I'm actually gonna talk about uh, the first six weeks, and those are possibly uh, the most important weeks of college career. So uh, we're going to unpack that a little bit together. And then at the end, I hope to talk about some fall 2020 items uh, and anything that's related to COVID-19 and, and kind of open up our conversation there. Uh, I do want to be honest. Uh, this is a lot of information for 45 minutes or so. Uh, and like I said, um, I'll do my best to kind of look at the questions and my colleagues are pinging me on the side. Uh, to, to let me know if there's anything that I can go over in more detail. But we may also have more ample time uh, at the end to kind of field questions and I can do my best to respond uh, in the moment. So let's go ahead and get started. So a beautiful balance, uh, what is this? Uh, if you're familiar with uh, say higher education, uh, it's sort of one of those lingo words that are kind of passed around, but Challenge and support is sort of a lens, a perspective on how the university works to engage students, especially in uh, the student affairs area where we do programming, events, and, and so on, sort of the co-curricular experience. But a lot of faculty embrace this challenge and support uh, mantra as well. But challenge and support uh, is really about uh, this philosophy or theory on how students grow and develop. Uh, so if you see here with these sort of colorful rectangles, on the left is this level of support going vertical, and then the level of challenge going sort of left and right. Um, but what I want to play out for you is for you to kind of plant this seed in your mind on how you challenge and support your student as they navigate college careers, or their curriculum, or just challenges that maybe they face both in the classroom, or on campus, or remote campus, or off in life. Um, and really what I want to highlight are sort of the extremes. Uh, if a student has a lot of support, but no challenge, meaning almost too much support in any face of challenge, there tends to be stagnation. Uh, that's sort of this area over here on the left. Um, for the student's perspective, things might feel boring, a little tedious, or maybe even themselves not feeling very pr productive. Because unfortunately, in some cases, if an environment's too supportive, uh, students may just feel that things will work out for them, that things will be provided uh, without having to do much work. Now on the opposite end of too much challenge is where you see retreat. If there's too much challenge and not enough support, students are overwhelmed and there's maybe apprehension to try new things. Uh, there's a lot of stress and maybe even anxiety, but moreover, students are overwhelmed. 
they don't have support in the face of challenge, uh, we do see a lot of students drop out. And that's the retention issue where students retreat from the college experience. Now, if there's low support and low challenge, so the far left corner, uh, that's what, where you will see just disengagement. Students have low optimism or low reason to be uh, engaged. Now, what we want to find is a high challenge environment like college. College should be challenging, but there should be ample support, a lot of resources, a lot of unconditional support where there's a continuum of learning, where students can try new things knowing there's a supportive environment. Uh, they can get creative knowing that maybe they can make mistakes and try something new, but they're still gonna be supportive. And there's a sense of renewal. They can kind of chip away the old versions of who they say were in high school and kind of rediscover themselves in a very challenging, rewarding, self-reflective space. And of course, what we want is development, growth, and learning. So again, this teeter-totter maybe of challenge of support uh, in your own way, you know your student best on how to support them and maybe how to challenge them. And at the university, we do that in many, many, many ways. In the classroom, faculty may challenge students to uh, think through an essay and think through a discussion or an impromptu uh, exam. And, and the challenge might be, oh, I didn't study or maybe I didn't prepare well. And that is a moment in which they learn from and they revise. Or maybe it's in an organization group and we're helping students get involved and they're having to think and kind of address conflict for the first time. All of that is good learning experiences. And in some ways we take a step back from supporting and getting ourselves involved so the students can learn. But another way to maybe look at this and sort of a diagram here to kind of help you understand ways that you might indirectly or directly support your student or directly or indirectly challenge your student. Uh, openly discussing problems versus solving the problem for the student. That is an element in a teeter-totter dance uh, of challenge and support. Or maybe you're encouraging them to have insights uh, from a problem they've had to solve future problems. Or allowing your student to make mistakes and giving them the room to learn from that mistake on their own. But what I hope to give you all tonight as I go through this presentation is moments where I will ask you ways in which you might challenge and support your student in your own way. And then moments where you realize that the university is challenging and supporting your student. And together, uh, we're partners in this process. Uh, it's a unique ecosystem. It really does take a village to help each and every individual student. And what I wanna emphasize, and maybe this is my disclaimer tonight, is that we're all partners in student success. And together, we all can support and challenge students. And again, as I mentioned, college, should be challenging, college should be difficult. And that's what uh, really gives students sort of the grit, the perseverance and the energy post uh, college when they graduate to enter the career force and uh, be navigating the world and for how complex it is and can be. Uh, but again, I do really wanna emphasize that we're partners uh, in this process. So again, I'm grateful that you're all here. Um, and really, as we go through the rest of the presentation, keep that in the back of your mind, that challenge and support. How are you going to maybe, again, support your student through some elements and other places that you might want to, again, challenge them. So for this next piece, I want to focus on ways to start strong. Um, we're making an assumption that the 350 folks here tonight, most of your students are first year students. This is their first semester. If you're a transfer or students of transfer and, and you're here, a lot of this information will still be relevant as every institution is different and every transition in itself is different as well. So for starting strong, these might seem like some obvious points or some, uh, sorry, let me go back one more. Um, some maybe points in which you would be like, hey, well, this feels like common sense. Um, and that's, that's okay. And we want to uh, definitely emphasize that some of these items uh, might be overlooked by students from time to time. And we wanna remind you here. So number one, attending class. Uh, attending class uh, is a moment in which students sometimes take for granted. And some, in many cases, students aren't required to go to class. Uh, there's liberty there. Students have free will to determine if they need to go to class and, and some faculty will not make it required to attend. Uh, that's sort of one of those moments of autonomy that students have as they mature into a college career. Uh, but we just want to emphasize that attending class uh, really does set the stage of success. It is the bedrock. 
uh, they have access to their peers, they have access to the faculty, they are able to ask questions and explore and dive deep in the assignments and the expectations uh, that they have for them. The next one uh, is to ask questions. We encourage students to be inquisitive and a lot of students make this assumption that they should have it all figured out. And what's ironic is a lot of first year students don't tell the other students that they're having a hard time or they're nervous or they don't know things. Uh, and that's human nature, right? You, as a new college student, you wanna feel like, hey, I've got here, I kinda got it figured out. But the university is a very large, complex system. There's a lot of departments and staff and faculty and peers and a lot of different moving parts. So students finding that comfort to ask questions. So you might wanna challenge your student instead of maybe finding answers for them to say, hey, well, why don't you ask someone? Why don't you ask your professor or ask a staff person or go to that help desk uh, and see if they can help guide you to solving this problem. And that's really why we're here, uh, to support the student in that effort. So asking questions is important. Attending office hours with their faculty is also one of those critical items where st students can really get an idea of what's expected and, and maybe seek clarity. Because in the moment of a lecture, some information could get lost. So uh, the next item here uh, is network, uh, to network and meet new people. Uh, that's one of those items where students are so um, maybe trying to figure it out. And now, especially as we're remote, learning that in a very new way. Uh, but I wanna emphasize that there's gonna be programs and resources and clubs and tons of re and, and opportunities ahead that students can network and connect with each other, but they're gonna have to take that effort uh, to meet their peers and maybe even make some invitation uh, to kind of put out that olive branch and say, you know, could I maybe study with you via Zoom or, hey, would you like to do a study group via Zoom? Or, hey, let's unpack the syllabus together in this first week and make sense of everything. So uh, this network and meeting new people is really essential for students to feel that they have people that are navigating this experience with them, that they're not alone. And that is a, a, an important, important step to make. So uh, the next piece I wanna emphasize here is organize. Um, many students will get overwhelmed and they don't take that important first step uh, to really think about um, what they need to do to kind of set the stage to be actively organized in preparing for all their assignments and programs and workshops or group meetings and so on. Uh, so I, I, I encourage and we really encourage students in these first few weeks to actively engage in their course syllabi. Uh, that syllabus, for lack of better words, is a bit of a cheat sheet. Uh, it's one of those items where it's going to lay out what the entire semester looks like for that one particular class. Uh, so we want students to calendar important deadlines, to check due dates, to look at the academic calendar, and really take a big picture view when they put everything in and using their technology helps them do that uh, to say, ooh, maybe this week in October, hypothetically, is gonna be really difficult. It's gonna be really challenging. And they can plan and prepare appropriately. Uh, building out reading schedules and uh, different, uh, say, resources to help think about how they're gonna navigate into midterms or into finals. So these important starting strong first steps, organize is probably one that I would say is, if not one of the most important, the most important to really set things up to make sure they kind of have an idea of where they're at and where they're going. Next, uh, this is a bit more abstract, kind of preparing for the long race. It kind of fuses all those together. Uh, everything from attending class to meeting people to staying organized, but being prepared for the long race. You know, reviewing all those class assignments, creating reading schedules, but really to pace themselves. Uh, it's gonna be really important to anticipate when that busy time will be for them and to think ahead. Uh, when do they wanna meet with an academic advisor to plan for spring? Or when do they want to really plan and organize a study group or visit with the tutoring center? All of those are ways that students can think ahead and hold themselves up to making sure that uh, they're, they're involved and that they're ready to uh, really get engaged. And, and that's preparing for the long race is sort of that thinking long term and, and have to kind of pull yourself out of the moment. And that's a hard thing to do where you can maybe support your student. Hey, have you thought about what the next few weeks will look like? Now I wanna focus in on academics in respect to starting strong. Uh, 
uh, obviously we're going to be remote for the fall. Uh, because of the pandemic and the challenges that we're facing, the university made a very, very difficult decision, but in the best interest of student health, of staff and faculty and student safety, as well as the community at large in San Francisco. And with guidance of uh, the city and the state, uh, we are remote for the full fall. So these systems that I try to really lay out and try to make it sort of succinct and easy to remember are gonna be really critical for students to stay in tune with what's happening on campus. Obviously, Zoom, which we're all here together, uh, is San Francisco's main web conference service. All students and faculty and staff can create Zooms. They all have their official Zoom account through the university. And they can enter Zoom rooms and meetings and facilitate and create their own uh, at will. So it's a really powerful tool. Uh, and it has been, in some ways, kind of our bread and butter to make sure that we all are staying connected uh, in a meaningful way. iLearn is San Francisco State's course management system. Uh, all students have access to an iLearn. Uh, that is central to their class. Uh, faculty manage these spaces. Faculty manage them very differently. Some faculty might already be broadcasting their iLearn uh, pages and resources and, and actually starting to talk with students in that space. Some might actually wait till the first or second week or even after the first class meeting. So every faculty person or lecturer or professor might do it a bit differently. But iLearn is that central place that students will kind of keep in tune uh, with their individual classes. Now, email, uh, it might seem kind of like casual and not a really important topic to go over, but it's actually the most important. Uh, all students have access to their San Francisco State email, and the university uh, utilizes the student's email account as the primary form of communication to all students. So it's essential that students regularly check their email. Uh, research is currently showing that students, the entering cohort, these 18 to 20 year olds, are checking social media on the average of 15 to 20 times a day. Uh, checking email uh, should be part of that routine. Uh, unfortunately, it's not. I have my own hypothesis to that, I think because it kind of has a triggering response that usually is more professional and requires some action. Uh, but students need to check their email, especially now as we're relying on remote modalities like Zoom, like iLearn and digital communication, checking email, getting connected with resources and everything that the university has to offer uh, will be home in that email. Now, a lot of students will forward their uh, San Francisco State email to their personal account, which is totally OK. But I know a lot of students who have tons of subscriptions to things like H&M and Gap and Macy's and even cars or car magazines, whatever it might be, but that's a lot of noise to kind of stay organized. Um, so I, I definitely want to make sure that you encourage your student, challenge them to check their email on a very regular basis. And they can even use the algorithms built into those, those smartphones uh, to get reminders of any time that San Francisco State uh, alerts them of a notification or an important update. Uh, so those are tools that they can use to their advantage, and this essential technology is really going to propel uh, their access to campus and resources um, abroad. Now, another important piece for starting strong is tutoring. Now, a lot of students assume tutoring is one thing, that it's a meeting with somebody one-on-one -on -one to learn about classes and assignments. Uh, but tutoring is actually this four-part system. Um, number one is faculty office hours. Students who regularly meet with their faculty uh, to talk about assignments or tests or just to have general conversations through a sense of mentorship or advising do very, very well in class. Now, a lot of students find it a bit intimidating to meet with a faculty person. And you know what? That's, that's fair. I'm even intimidated by some faculty folks. I know they're brilliant people. They've been studying one subject for their entire life. Uh, but I also remind first year students that tell me, like, oh, I'm kind of nervous. I haven't done that before. I remind them that faculty at one point in their life used to be college students. And if anything, they used to be first time students too. So going into that meeting and asking that question, what was your first year at college like is a great way to break the ice because I'm sure many faculty love to unpack that and they honestly don't maybe get that question very often. So again, faculty office hours are essential. They're the, the planet's core of academic support because the assignments and the work is directly 
connected to that source of their faculty. So going to those office hours is part one of tutoring. Part two is that more traditional sense uh, where they're going to go to a tutoring center and meet with tutors who are uh, there to support them. San Francisco State has the Tutoring and Academic Support Center, which we call TASC. It's this university-wide resource that's going to be remote uh, all fall and all, all year for students to meet with uh, tutors for individual tutoring or assignment-based tutoring or even group work. It's a really holistic center to support students, but most of the time they ask, did you meet with your faculty? Did you ask about this assignment? So sometimes they have to go back to step one. Now the other, say step three, uh, is department-based tutoring. Uh, specific discipline-based support, uh, where there's advising support in and out of the class. So that's where students can actually tap into a particular department, say English, and they might have different programs and student groups and different, say, co-curricular experiences from that department to complement their degree or that particular course. So another great, rich, work, rich, uh, say, resource of tutoring. And then there's course-based tutoring. Uh, they tend to lean for more of those historically known courses uh, that network students and faculty together. So that accounting class or that calculus class uh, where tutoring tends to gravitate around. So again, tutoring's four main points that students want to, again, utilize to start strong. Now, if your student identifies with any learning disability or a limitation of any kind, we have a program called DPRC, uh, the Disability Programs and Resource Center. Uh, it is a very important place that if your student identifies with any limitation that you wanna meet with them as soon as possible. Uh, they're a central space to make sure your student gets connected with resources uh, that really help them uh, have accommodations so they're successful in and out of the classroom. Uh, they are the experts. They are there to help uh, understand the accommodations that a student needs, and those are wide-ranging. So services could be anything from exam accommodations, physical access, assistive technology, note-taking, priority registration even. Uh, but what's important to know is that you do want to meet with them sooner than later. Uh, and then they also have their office open during uh, remote modalities. But I want to also highlight um, that your student may discover that they have a learning disability or a limitation uh, as they're navigating college, and that's okay. Uh, but that self-realization, this office is a great place to make sure students have access uh, and support and resources to be successful in a wide range of systems that the university operates within. So again, DPRC is an important, important thing to kind of keep in mind. And again, if your student identifies or you want more information, you can contact new student programs and we'll be uh, happy to refer you and get you connected with them. Okay, we're now to part three. So we've thought about, again, challenge and support, those essential steps, right? How are you gonna challenge your student to check their email or how are you gonna support them to be more organized? All of that's gonna be unique to your student and in our own way as we work with students as well, we do the same. So with part three, uh, it's kind of into essential services. Now there's gonna be a lot of questions here in respect to uh, how student health services work and what access do students have and so on. Um, so I, I'm going to go through this and then I'll kind of pause and look through some of the questions to see if there's anything a bit more specific. Um, but I also want to recognize that uh, a lot of this is tied to tuition and fees. And I'm a pretty blunt, transparent person. Um, a lot of this is complex. And especially as we have been responding to the pandemic, the university has res been responding in respect to tuition and fees. And they've been very transparent about that process. A lot of that information is found online. But I'll try to unpack that with us here as well and make sense of why students are still paying tuition and fees and, and how that still fits into um, their college experience for this next fall. So I wanna start off with student health. Uh, all students pay into the student health fee. And what I like to sort of emphasize is that this is a large umbrella, a very large umbrella of services and resources that are available to students uh, across campus. And uh, those services really include the four that are listed underneath the health fee. Uh, that's uh, the Student Health Center, uh, Mental and Emotional Health Services, Health Promotion and Wellness, and then Recreation or sort of the Wellness Center. Uh, so we'll unpack some of that in more detail, but I want to speak to them kind of casually here. 
Um, first, Student Health Center. Many families are surprised that we have actually a full operating health center on campus. It's sort of your general practitioner's office uh, that students can drop in, get health appointments, do lab work, all of that is available to them. And the idea here is that it's based on convenience. So students can drop into the health center as they're moving about campus. And of course, I'm speaking to what I'm, we're all hoping for when we're back on campus, but this office is still open remotely. We're still supporting students uh, if they have medical concerns through technical means. Um, but I also want to emphasize that when students are back on campus, uh, there is a lot of resources and information through this health center to support students in their holistic biological health, but also educating students on how to stay healthy. Uh, they have access to a nutritionist, a dietitian, there's a pharmacy, there's a lab, all of that's available to students um, once they're on campus and remotely. There's mental and emotional health services. We call this CAPS, Counseling and Psychological Services. And that's where students can get the mental emotional support. That could be individual counseling, group counseling, um, couples counseling, anger management. There's an office in uh, mental and emotional or CAPS called uh, The Safe Place, which specifically supports any victims of domestic or sexual assault. Uh, so it's a very confidential safe place to make sure uh, anyone that's experiencing that type of experience, they're able to get the support both um, in medical terms, in legal terms, uh, and as they navigate the university. Health promotion and wellness uh, is sort of the holistic education center for students that help students are, um, get connected with uh, how they themselves can learn about who they are uh, and manage stress or eat healthy or understand sex and relationships and drugs and alcohol. Uh, it's a very broad educational resource that students have at their fingertips to learn more about themselves and learn about how they live and interact with others. And all that incorporates holistic wellness. Uh, health promotion and wellness also supports the basic needs initiative. So if students are ever experiencing homelessness or uh, food insecurity, uh, it's a central office to support students. And then finally, recreation. It's sort of the um, big system here that students have access uh, both in physical wellness uh, but also social wellness um, and campus recreation while we have a fitness center it's going to be closed for the fall but they're providing remote fitness classes all fall so students can do yoga they can do uh, all sorts of fitness classes like Zumba or body sculpting it's all built into this resource that students will have access to this fall so to kind of help break this down a little bit, I just want to emphasize some four main points. Uh, because students pay a health fee, a lot of families wonder, um, do we have to pay health insurance? So the student health fee is not a supplement to health insurance. So your students should still maintain health insurance. Now, health insurance is still required for international students or any students who are or will be living on campus, but generally all students have health insurance either through their family or they utilize, um, say, a family's medical insurance plan. Uh, health insurance is also provided through the, the CSU, but I would encourage you either reaching out to our office, we can get you connected to those resources. A lot of families have questions about immunizations, especially when we reopen, that's gonna be an, an important piece that students have documentation for their immunizations. We're still collecting those, which are due September 21st, and students can submit those to the registrar digitally. Uh, but if students don't know what their immunization status is, the health center can facilitate those uh, upon arriving to campus. There's always after hours care. What I wanna emphasize um, is that families should talk about emergencies. Even if you're at home, talk about what are the best practices for your own health, your own well-being in any scenario. Uh, there's always after hours care for students. There's an advice nurse, you'll see the phone number there. So if students are paranoid like me about my health, um, you can go down that WebMD rabbit hole and get worse. Uh, but there's an advice nurse, a medical professional could help unpack that for students. And then again, I wanna emphasize the educational health promotion component that's holistic to all of this, helping students be more health conscious, uh, making healthy choices, personal care, which is all again, kind of in that challenge and support mantra uh, for them to grow and learn. So to kind of visualize this, you can see all these systems around the student. 
uh, that really kind of bring an aura to their wellness. Um, so even if your student's home, challenging them to go for a run or go for a walk, get outside if you can, of course, safely, but it's so important. And I always tell this to, to students, as much as you're working out your mind, you should be working out your body. And that's something that we, of course, really celebrate and push on campus. So I'm gonna pause before we get to safety. The rest of the topics are pretty short and I wanna kind of look through a few questions uh, to see if there's anything that I can respond to live. Um, I see a handful of questions about housing for spring 2021. We're gonna get that to the end, but I'll share now and I will we'll repeat this. But for spring 2021, a decision hasn't been made yet, partly because the pandemic is still rapidly evolving. And until we know what the fall and what the winter looks like, uh, the university will make a decision and share that decision uh, to families, to students via email and on our website um, about what that decision will be. I anticipate, my gut tells me that it'll be closer to October, uh, partly so that um, the, the university has time to kind of understand what the guidance is from the chancellor's office, the city and the state. So all those housing questions about should students and will students be living on campus, can we return in the spring? I wanna be blunt and honest and transparent. We just don't know yet. And I encourage you and your student to stay active on our university website um, to find more information as it develops. Uh, there's a question here, is there a bookstore? Absolutely, it is open. So students can submit their text requests, order their books and purchase them, uh, and they could be delivered to home but students can export their book list and if they would choose to use a different vendor, that's up to them. Um, I see one question, will the university issue hotspots for students who live off campus? Um, there, that is an option, but our IT office tends to counsel students to make sure if they have a stable connection because hotspot Wi-Fi connections actually are pretty unstable uh, for the work of doing Zoom and say remote learning. Uh, so it is an option, but our IT office will help troubleshoot to see if the student can find a better uh, remote Wi-Fi connection. So again, I see a lot of questions about housing. I wish we knew more information, but we will we'll get to that um, hopefully later in the fall, but we'll talk about it more as we approach some of the COVID-19 pieces. Okay, I'm gonna scroll through a few more questions, so bear with me. So again, approval for housing, all that information, I know that's the hot topic tonight and, and maybe we can unpack that a bit more, uh, but a lot of that information, once the university makes a decision on what spring 2021 will look like, our housing and residential services will, will follow closely behind and what options are or possibly not available. Um, did students uh, receive an invitation for this webinar? It was only for those that RSVP, so uh, it was only in, immediately sent to families, so to students' uh, direct support. So some students might be here if their family encouraged them, but otherwise um, it's mostly families here tonight. Uh, I see in respect to book purchasing, um, maybe my team here can put a link to the university bookstore in the chat. Uh, from there, the student can log in, it imports all their classes, and the faculty say what books are attached to what classes, and then they'll populate and show the students what books they're required to have. Most students have a bit of a wiggle room the first week or two before, uh, thank you, Claudia, uh, before the semester really gains traction to get their books, and, and faculty are pretty flexible on that. Uh, I see one question about the health piece. Is it mandatory for students to buy student health? Um, well, it's mandatory with the student health fee. That health fee builds an infrastructure of services to students uh, for all four years. So hopefully, and I'm very confident, we'll be back on campus sooner than later. So maintaining and engaging and keeping those resources maintained is what that health fee goes to. And then again, students still have access to those health services remotely. Um, so I'm going to see if I can see a few more questions. I see a lot of about immunization. I didn't mean to trigger you all with that. Those forms are still technically required, but I want to give you some confidence. Most of those immunization records tend to follow the student's transcripts. So if your student went to a public institution prior to San Francisco State, there's usually a note there about immunizations and the record to the student. Now, the student needs to check their student center account. Uh, that's where all records and alerts are 
um, pinged to the student. Uh, and so being sort of proactive and checking that on a very regular basis, will students be able to know, oh, my immunization records didn't show up. And we intentionally set that September deadline so that students have time to get it in uh, before uh, the spring semester registration starts. So yes, they're still due. We wanna make sure those are uh, available so students can fluidly come back to campus once we formally reopen. Okay, I'm gonna pause from the questions for a moment. Uh, just kind of talk about safety because I see a couple questions about sort of just information around this. And this is an important topic as it comes to anticipating students coming back to campus, but also just other components of just having realistic challenge and support questions with your student. So around safety, uh, there is a university police department on campus that operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Their jurisdiction is campus. Uh, all students are encouraged to keep this 415-338-2222 number. Um, it's really good for students to have that in their phone. While 911, of course, will get them to the dispatcher, but we do reside in San Francisco. So there's multiple dispatchers that students can be pinged to upon calling from a mobile device. Uh, so having that direct line is important. I want to emphasize that through the University Police Department, there's the Campus Alliance for Risk free environment escort program. Uh, so anytime a student's on campus and they feel uncomfortable or they would like someone to escort them to their car or a different building or to the bus, uh, an officer will meet them, greet them, and escort them to that space. The university is also littered with blue lights. Uh, I know you'll be on campus at some point. You'll see these tall 10-foot poles or so that have a blue light on top and an intercom built in where anyone in a moment can um, sort of respond to a dispatcher. I just wanna highlight that there's an upcoming program through our university's uh, Gator Fest program, which I'll speak to in just a moment, called Chomp Fest with UPD, where they can meet the, you all, family, students alike, can meet with uh, the university police department. So some items I wanna to talk to safety here, students should embrace common sense and unplug from their technology, be aware from their surroundings, and then just engage a mantra or an idea of, community safety. Majority of crimes that do occur on campus tend to be crimes of opportunity. When students let their guard down, uh, they're not using sort of good intentions of like locking their doors or maintaining their personal belongings. We're a public institution with a lot of, uh, well, I'll say it, there's no walls, there's no gates, so there's a lot of open free space uh, in a typical semester. Uh, so I encourage you all to have a conversation with your student about their use of technology uh, there's these awesome noise canceling headphones with this great tech and students are shutting off all their senses and unfortunately students have new tech and new gear and expensive books and expensive book bags. Uh, so it's important that they're aware of those items and we'll again probably reemphasize this as students arrive uh, once campus reopens but this is an important piece that these three items keep students aware and alert of their surroundings. The other two pieces here are around communications. Uh, emergency communications, you as uh, a family uh, should all be tapped into the university's communication system, especially as we approach uh, this fall in relation to announcements and about the pandemic. And as you notice, we are currently in a fire crisis and there's smoke in San Francisco and we receive timely warnings and safety alerts about the air quality and all that information is tapped into the infrastructure connected to the student. So there's emergency communication protocols that students should update on a regular basis uh, and make sure that they are updating those. And you too can be tapped into that by following the university's website, the social media accounts and so on. So use this information, have very open conversations with your student about medical emergencies or different situational emergencies. So you all talk about it now uh, in the event that it may happen, you have a plan uh, and you have sort of a path uh, in the event of any situation on or off campus. So finances, this is a bit of a big one and we'll probably move into questions right after this. Um, so I, I wanted to highlight three main points uh, in which you can challenge and support your student around finances. That's financial aid, financial management, alerts, holds, and this issue or important policy called FERPA. Uh, first with financial aid and all of those items in respect to the student's financial account. Uh, financial aid and scholarships are essential. And of course, students should apply for their FAFSA on a regular basis. I tell families, put an alert on 
your phone right now as I'm talking for October 1st. That is when is a time to start pulling all the information together as you plan to reapply for the FAFSA. Uh, that's a great time to start to pick up that information and start applying. Uh, because in some ways, the early bird gets the worm. There's only so many grants available. And if students apply later in the system, they don't necessarily get access to those grants. So the sooner you apply, the better. Um, that FAFSA is, again, a really important thing to do. What's important though for students is they have to stay engaged with their student center account. That is their main gateway that is sort of, it's the way I kind of metaphor it is uh, it's their bank account as associated to the university. Uh, it's important and they need to check it regularly and they need to make sure it's balanced. Uh, and I tell students all this all the time. You should be checking to make sure things are balanced, if not every day, every other day. Because uh, important alerts and reminders will come to the student that's related to finances, but also alerts and holds that might prevent the student from registering because the university needs important information. I want to emphasize payments. Uh, whether your student accepts financial aid and their deferments dispersed, and that first payment has already passed on October, or excuse me, August 12th. Uh, but I want to emphasize that there's a 2.75% credit or debit fee tied to paying with a credit card or debit card. That's not the university getting an extra 2.75%. That's our convenience fee uh, that credit card companies issue. So you can plan accordingly. There's a wide range of payment options. If you're making payments or you plan for next semester, uh, keep that in mind. You could work with the Bursar. It's our financial services office to help make sure if any additional payment beyond financial aid is available. So I talked through all these and I kept scholarships to the last and I probably should break it apart in the slide, but I wanna emphasize how important scholarships are. San Francisco State students, and I'm not sure why, I kind of stay awake at night thinking about this, but scholarships um, on our campus aren't really utilized. And what I wanna mean here is our San Francisco State students don't apply for scholarships and I'm not quite sure why. So if your student's sitting next to you or you're writing notes, all caps, scholarships, underline, 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 hashtag, and make sure that your student is exploring available scholarships through the financial aid uh, website. They're available, that's free money, and you just kind of have to do the work to apply. I kind of play out um, a diagram here. I just wanna really quickly explain disbursement. So if Chris here uh, accepted financial aid of say a total package, award package there of $5,700, but tuition and fees come to 3720. Chris has a positive remainder, meaning there's $1,900 that is extra, a difference from that financial aid. So what I wanna emphasize here is that additional aid is sent to the student. And that additional aid could be a direct deposit or a check cut to the student. And it's only gonna go to the student. And what I wanna emphasize here is that there might be additional costs like books or lab fees or living expenses, commuting costs, anything. But I know, and I know this from personal experience, when I got some additional aid, I was like, awesome Xbox or new wardrobe. And that's maybe not the best use, I'm telling you it's not the best use of financial aid disbursement, but in some cases, emergencies happen, computer breaks or you know, a jacket gets ruined. All those things are appropriate and okay to utilize for financial aid. But what I wanna emphasize here is students should really utilize uh, their additional aid if they're fortunate to have it wisely and professionally. Okay, this is my favorite part and it's gonna roll into questions. The first six weeks. So the first six weeks, as you're about to start tomorrow, students will be um, kind of on a whole new journey. And research shows that the first six weeks of college are the most critical and important of the entire college career. And a lot of research has been showing this for decades. And what it's really about is this academic, social, and support transition that students need to be discovered and familiar with. I'm falling back on that challenge and support item again. But the more students are actively engaged in these first six weeks or so, uh, that students will find more success, are better in class, doing good, are per persistent throughout the rest of their college career. And 
for the academic piece is students recognizing the significant transition, the challenges between high school and college and what is different and where they might have challenges based on the, the rigor and, and how they're different. The social piece is meeting new people, getting involved, but also managing the stress of having a social and academic life. And the other piece is finding support, asking for help. And this should all sound familiar, those first steps that I uh, emphasized in starting strong. So what does this look like maybe for your student? Um, you can just take a quick look here, but paying attention, showing up on the first week, these don't necessarily need to be in chronological order. Um, but these are really important things that students can do in the first six weeks, and I'll just list them for you. Pay attention and show up. Meet new people or get involved. So there'll be clubs and organizations that are meeting remotely. Uh, find a routine. Should include fitness, going to bed at a regular time, waking up, eating healthy. Um, maybe the next piece here is learn about the university. Take an active approach and learn about advising or learn about tutoring or learn about financial aid and, and learn about the institution and, and where you're going to school. And then maybe the other piece is meeting with professors and making an active diligent plan to understand who your instructors are. But I also tell students all the time, put your face to the name in their grade book, get and build that rapport, understand who they are so they can understand you as well. And then ask for help on a regular basis. Whenever you hit a wall or you hit a hurdle or you're not sure what direction to go, ask for help. And they might ask you as a family or they can contact new student programs or they can go to the Dean's Students Office and, and ask for help. So again, um, as I mentioned, the university is very aware of this transition and we build programs even for the first eight weeks and we call that Gator Fest. And for the next eight weeks, uh, it's actually been almost nine now, because uh, we did programming last week to get students kind of warmed up. We have over 90 programs to keep students engaged uh, throughout these first eight weeks. So we encourage your student to kind of tap in. We send out the Frosh memo, it goes out tomorrow, which is gonna list all these great events that are available to them. And it's on them to kind of go, to show up, to participate. So help us uh, in supporting or maybe challenging your, your student to participate. Now, what might this look like for you as a family in supporting your student for the first six weeks? Uh, give some space. They might need some space in these first six weeks to kind of figure out how this is working for them, especially as you are remote. That's going to be different, and they're going to have to understand what that's like for them as they're going through the full experience. Actively listen. Uh, have good conversations. Unpack the challenges. Unpack the successes and determine what that means for them. Uh, connect with what they're doing. Be curious. Ask them to teach you what they learned in class or what they learned that week. Uh, and, and be curious in what they're doing. And I'll also offer, you know, some questions might be like, hey, how was your day? Um, I would tell you my response would be fine. It was okay. But if you shift it to say, tell me about your day, uh, it could be really wide open and wide ranging. So even those little shifts can be very important. Make plans together. Set some short-term and long-term goals. You know, hey, after midterms, maybe we'll have a hike or we'll go see some family or we'll cook your favorite dinner or we'll, we'll do something random that students, your student could have something to look forward to, say, past week four. Um, support mistakes. And I'm going to tell you all right now, even at the comfort of home, your student's going to make a mistake. They're going to forget an assignment. They're going to miss a due date. Uh, they're going to do something. And supporting those mistakes is really powerful and really important. And then challenge them to be their best. Uh, and there again, there's support and challenge. I'm sure you're tired of me saying it, but it's such an important part of the college experience so that they feel they've got support in any challenge that they're facing. I wanna emphasize new student programs. Uh, this is a really important resource for students where they can tune in and meet with our peer mentors. We have about 30 peer mentors that are available and they're sending emails to students they're engaging with them, they're talking with them, they're here to support them, but your student can drop into our help desk Monday through Friday and ask for support. And we're there to support them, nine to four o'clock. We have set hours just to talk with students if they need support or some direction. There's also the Dean on Call program, uh, which is really focused on advocacy, referral, and support to students in their entire experience. So anyone that's navigating the university and has, has, has some difficulty and not sure where to go, the Dean on Call program is a great place to drop in. And they too are open remotely via the spring semester and students can um, just 
drop in with an email, drop in via Zoom and ask to meet with the Dean on call and they'll get that support. So here we are, we're gonna talk like, what's it looking like? Let's have some dialogue and questions. I'm gonna open up the chat again. We're at the last five, oh, we're at seven. I apologize, we're a little late, I'm sorry. Um, I wanna make sure we're answering some of these questions and I'm not sure, Nisha, if you're here, if you wanna turn on your mic or any of the other staff to guide any questions I could respond to, I'm happy to. Um, and as you're kind of tuning in, uh, just, open to any questions. I'm, I'm happy to kind of unpack those. Um, we are, hi Chris, um, and hi everyone. Um, we are getting um, a lot of questions over um, if they're still gonna get physical IDs and how they can mm -hmm. do so um, or anything about that. Yeah, so last I heard, uh, physical IDs would be available to the student if they submitted their photo uh, through the ID cloud card system. Uh, students can find that via their website, via OneCard. That's the department that manages those systems. Uh, and they will, um, of course, issue the card. From what I've heard, they're waiting to the start of fall to issue them out. So they'll mail them out to the student. But at this point, for most of our students, there's really no need to use it. So they will receive it eventually. Um, but from, again, what I last heard, this was a few weeks ago, was that they would be mailing them out. Um, it may change, but I, again, students can submit their photo and their card would be created. Um, we also have a question here. Is there a student and parent alert that keeps us posted with any emergencies that happen um, on campus? So, yes and no. Uh, so it will always be alerted to the student. So students have their responsibility to update their communication system in the student center. Again, that sort of bank account metaphor to the student. There they can update their communication system. Uh, the university by law has to alert students via email and if the student updates their phone number via text message of any alerts or safety concerns on campus or around campus. And all of those uh, alerts are posted to the university's website by um, a timely warning um, system and policy that we maintain. So as a family, uh, your student can update your contact information as an emergency contact, but the university is gonna correspond only with the student. And this is a really good opportunity for me to talk about FERPA, uh, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. FERPA uh, really is a federal law that protects students' information, whether that's academic, medical, curricular, behavioral, disciplinary, all that information is private to the student and only the student. So hypothetically, if Chris's mom, Patty is her name, wants to call and ask how I'm doing or if I'm going to class, the university will not share that information because they can only share it with the student and only the student. Now there are exceptions, and I understand that some of you and many of you may be paying for your student uh, to go to college. So even that financial aid information is protected and will only be shared to the student and with the student. The exceptions are is your student can apply for a uh, FERPA waiver, and that's all gonna be unique to each individual record. Uh, so that is where you can call on behalf of your student. You cannot fill that out for your student. Your student has to initiate it and submit it. Uh, if you were to do that on their behalf, that would be illegal. Um, and again, this isn't meant to be a barrier, but unfortunately there are systems in which, or scenarios, excuse me, excuse me uh, where uh, some students have lost financial aid because um, some families aren't cohesive units and they take students' financial aid. And some families have restraining orders or some families have protections uh, that need to be maintained. Um, but further, there's always an exception. The student can provide that Witten Raver uh, and beyond that, that's kind of FERPA. So that's how even the emergency protocol information, it's on the student to update that information. Um, so since we're actually kind of talking about fees, um, we're getting a lot of questions about tuition specifically. So if you mm -hmm. could just maybe, um, we're getting questions like, when is the tuition fee due? If you can maybe talk a little bit about the service fee associated with tuition. Yep. Um, those are kind of some of the main questions we we're getting. Sure. So tuition and fees. Uh, so tuition is all for the academics. So the curricular degree seeking um, costs. 
those are, again, all this information is issued on the university website. Uh, those fees, for what I understand, have been maintained um, because it's still, again, a temporary situation that we're in. Uh, but further, uh, students um, will be paying into that fee because they're still going to class, they still have access to class, even though it's remote, uh, those services are, are again degree seeking. The fees part, like the student health fee, uh, campus recreation fee, and other fees that are supplemental, those fees have been, um, in some cases, adjusted, but not all, partly because most of those services, I believe 90 plus percent of those services are still available remotely, like the student health center, uh, students still have access to counseling. There's still campus rec remote um, physical fitness courses and so on. So some of those fees have been adjusted uh, given that students can't go to the fitness center, they can't go to the gym and so on. And you, those reflections have been addressed. Uh, so hopefully I'm getting to that question. If you mm -hmm. want to learn more, um, maybe one of the students here with us can pull up uh, the tuition and fees link and we could put it there where it kind of breaks all it down um, unless you all want me to dive to that level. Um, I'll wait to kind of see how people if people sort of sure. have more specific questions there um, but we're could you maybe also talk a little bit about some of these specific tech tools um, a lot of people are asking questions about logging into iLearn um, and then also if they have classes next week. Some of them um, are saying they haven't really heard anything from the professors. Is it, you know, kind of wait and be patient for them to post it? Or, you know, is there another, you know, uh, other resources they should be taking advantage of? These are great questions. You all are on the right pace uh, at the right time of things. Um, so first, access. Uh, all students really have access to iLearn, to Zoom, to their student center by logging into what is their uh, gateway system. Uh, that is sort of a central hub that gets them access to iLearn and their student center. Uh, you can find that on the university's homepage, uh, but students can log into their iLearn and they should see what classes they've been enrolled in. And each of those classes should have a corresponding uh, iLearn page. That page is sort of a home, a digital home for that class. Now, some students may not start classes tomorrow uh, because maybe they selected a schedule that leans more Tuesday, Thursday. Some students have Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes. And some professors may say, hey, we're, you know, we're Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but our first class won't be till Wednesday. So you might see cases like that where this first week is a bit staggered uh, and scaffold in different ways. Um, but more or less, uh, that iLearn is central. They log in through their student center account. You can simply Google um, iLearn SFSU and it should take you to the home login screen. Now, if some faculty haven't posted their sites yet, that might be, be because they're wanting to first meet face to face to talk about how to utilize iLearn. Some faculty might use it very little. They might only use it for grades. Uh, and posting grades and all assignments would be discussed and provided, say, via the Zoom and meeting, say, here in a space like this. So every faculty person may do it differently. Um, but I understand majority of faculty will either open their iLearn right around now in this first few days of the semester if they haven't already, or some will wait after the first class meeting. It, again, it kind of depends on the, the faculty person. So we have... Um just for everyone's kind of knowledge. We have about like, I think three more questions that we're getting just a lot of. So I'm gonna go through those and then maybe we can sort of just touch base about time and see if we have any other just really um, important questions to ask. Um, can you talk a little bit about parking and transportation uh, for students? So one, uh, the parking lot on campus, also um, how buses and the shuttle is changing and um, any of the uh, student benefits when it comes to uh, uh, transportation discounts? So first, in respect to parking, if there's, there's a few assumptions I can make here. So it depends if your student is moving to San Francisco or plans to move to San Francisco. So let's first talk about that group. So if your student is persistent and they say, I want to bring my car and they are moving to San Francisco uh, and their car, which I relate, is kind of their baby, I get it. Um, Honestly, we wouldn't recommend it, uh, not bringing a car. Don't bring a car, uh, it's expensive. 
uh, especially in San Francisco proper. Um, partly, if your student's parking on campus, it is not cheap uh, at all. The university is not investing in building parking garages. Uh, they are investing in residential buildings and academic buildings. So we only have one main parking garage on campus, and we actually have to stagger uh, the parking permit. So you can either get a, a two-day pass, a three-day pass, or a five-day pass. Um, I, the, I'm going to roll the numbers off the top of my head here, but this is only per semester. So a two-day pass, I think, is about just under $300. Uh, a three-day pass, I think, is close to $400. And the five-day pass, I think, is around $600. And that's just to park a car. You know, they're not going to rotate the tires or change the oil, uh, it's just a park. So we majority of the time, if a student has the option to bring a car, we say at least for the first year, don't. Um, partly because there's just large infrastructure in San Francisco through the Muni, uh, which is our buses and light rail, uh, and then BART, which is the Bay Area Rapid Transit, uh, which um, of course goes kind of throughout the whole Bay Area. Students have discount to those systems. So if a student, um, again, lives in San Francisco, they can ride Muni uh, at cost, meaning they pay a, uh, a fee, a transportation fee, and that fee allows them to jump on and off Muni seven days a week as many times as they want. Now for a San Francisco State resident, I think that's close to $100 a month now to have that unlimited pass. Um, whereas students, they pay, I think it's $180 and they have unlimited um, access per year on that fee. Um, now, if your student lives in the Bay Area and they're commuting, those parking costs still exist. And if car is the only option, uh, then the reality is utilizing the parking garage. Some students park in and around campus in the neighborhood, which that's usually not a good idea, only because residential parking permits. So if you live in a particular neighborhood, you have to have a neighborhood pass. And the average parking ticket in San Francisco, I think, is $88 now. Uh, if you don't turn your wheels the right way or you don't park in the right zone, $80. Bucks. Um, there are no seven-day parking permits. You typically don't have to pay to park um, on the weekends because campus is typically closed. Um, whereas if you're living on campus, you have to park your car in a residential parking area, and that is a lottery because there's only so many parking permits for those that actually physically live on campus. Um, I hope I got to all that. I'm, I'm happy to unpack it some more. And actually, um, before I kind of continue with some of these uh, really broad questions that we're seeing from a lot of people, um, what is the best uh, email perhaps for parents and families to get in touch with us with some specific questions just to make sure we really follow up with everyone? Um, you know, we are making this presentation available. Um, the PDF of the presentation will be available. There will be links that everyone can click on, but just what's the best contact place for people? Honestly, Nisha, I think it will be our office, New Student Programs, uh, which is, I can put it in the chat. Uh, our team will get back to you. Um, and if in any case that you would even want to try to do a one-on-one -on -one chat, I'm, I'm open to do that. My calendar is pretty full, um, but we're always, you know, willing to kind of try to respond uh, to, to families based on more individual questions. Because uh, if it is a personal question, this may not be the best, um, the best space for those. So I'm happy to work with you via email uh, through our NSP department. So my team and new student programs would be happy to respond to, to some more specific questions. Perfect. Um, I did see a quick question in the chat. What about parking seven days per week? Are they are weekends free? I think I kind of responded to that. And then were the parking fees per month? No, that'd be per semester. So when I was talking about the three to four to $600 parking passes, that was per semester. Um, and can you address a little bit, maybe some of the, I don't know, the top tech issues families might anticipate in these first coming weeks that maybe they can kind of be on the lookout for, um, and then also kind of related to that, it was related to my mind, um, for anyone who has uh, lab requirements, um, can you just maybe speak a little bit about what that looks like in this upcoming semester? 
So first with tech issues, that is a brilliant question. And honestly, I've been thinking a lot about that. I think with the tech, um, it's going to be stable Wi-Fi. Um, so I would look into your internet provider and determine, you know, where you fit, excuse me, fit into the, the Wi-Fi system. But generally I would kind of set some house rules around Wi-Fi. You know, if, if class is in session, try to limit your bandwidth. Uh, because if you've got your phones connected and your TV's on and you're streaming and you're listening to music all at the same time, that's a stretch on the bandwidth of your Wi-Fi. So I think that would be issue number one is getting kind of a choppy connection because this video system that we're doing, I'm actually hosting and recording the Zoom on a server at home. Um, and that's a big system um, and, and it's requiring a lot of bandwidth. Um, and I, I don't think most homes are built that way, but uh, I would just probably kind of set some ground rules around the family <laughs> on that one. Also, I think other pieces would be relying too much on your on the phone. If your student is relying on their phone to go to class and do Zoom, that's not gonna last very long. Uh, the computer really f sets the tone to stay focused. Uh, and, and I've seen students wanna chime in via their mobile devices um, and participate for long hours via their, their mobile phone. And um, I, I would strongly advise against that. Uh, and then I think, you know, the other piece is more the psychosocial uh, staring at a screen all day, which I think a lot of us are probably familiar of and, and you're, you're maybe at wit's end with it. Uh, your students should plan out active breaks, um, tentative time on their day to get away from a screen, to go on a walk, to get uh, their body moving. Uh, you know, we, we do an, my partner and I do an activity at home that any time, like, we have 10 minutes be between a meeting or whatever, we go for a walk or even we do a little push-up contest. So it's a way just to move our bodies, um, I think is gonna be the other tech, it's not a tech issue, but I think it's a tech issue for our well-being. Uh, Nisha, what was the other part of your question? With yes, respect to um, it was about lab, labs. Yes, um, labs, um, that's, that's all gonna be very specific. So in most cases, it's gonna be remote. So some labs don't actually require lab work but for first year students, traditional first time uh, freshmen, uh, they would not have a lab class or be required to come to campus. Uh, there are no first year students arriving to campus. The only two or 3% of students that are coming to campus are our graduate students or near graduation students that need those face-to-face, -face, quote unquote, face-to-face -face, uh, instruction but other labs will be supplemental to the class. So those labs might have an additional Zoom meeting that meets once a week. Uh, that would be, again, supplemental to the main course. Great. And we're about 20 minutes past seven, and I do want to be mindful of people's time. Um, although we're getting, I mean, we have just tons of great questions. I wish we could stay here all night. <laughs> But um, there is one that uh, is a little specific, but I do think uh, might be worth answering. Um, one person mentioned that their family had to be evacuated this week, mm -hmm. um, and that might be a reality for more of our families and students. So if this happens, especially during this first week, during remote, what are your suggestions in just you know helping with sort of communicating with the university, making sure that the student still has the resources they need and being able to access what they need to access? Um. Well, first, my, my heart's with you all. That's really hard to hear. Um, I want to just assure you that there's going to be options for you and your student. Uh, first, I would encourage your student to contact the faculty and, and let them be aware of their situation. Uh, and then emailing uh, the dean of students office. Uh, I'm confident that this is going to be a, a large conversation with our team in the dean of students. Uh, to, to work and advocate on behalf of students that there's some flexibility um, because while the semester needs to move forward and, and students across the whole state and some are even across the country uh, to, to still be enrolled and actively participating in class, um, I'm sure between academic affairs and the provost and the dean of students office, uh, there'll be a lot of conversations about how to support students in this remote time and giving some flexibility until um, there's more calm on the horizon. But best piece is to just push communication out. Um, there's no harm in advocating for, for yourself and the student can email their faculty, just a casual note, 
of their situation and their concern and how to best stay on top of classes. Um, that, that would be my recommendation, but I want to give you some confidence that our office will be working with faculty to remind them that students and families are navigating this experience. And again, my, my sincerest apologies to you all. Um, thank you, Chris. And then I think I'm going to end it on one more question that I think might also help a lot of these more specific questions that we're getting. Um, is there a place, um, perhaps the new student programs website or something similar where perhaps a lot of these links that we've been sending out might be accessed? Um, so whether it's they need DPRC or just some of these other uh, resources we've talked about, is there maybe a central uh, page yeah. where uh, families can access that? Um, and then, um, yeah, yeah, thank you. Sure, let me actually pull that up for everyone now. Um, and this is really what the slide is here that you're looking at. Um, since the pandemic, uh, the universities had to respond in a wide sweeping way to best do a hard pivot, honestly, since March. As you can imagine, an institution of 30,000 uh, individuals plus staff and faculty had to just rethink our work and to support students. Um, so what I want to share with everyone in the chat is uh, the university's action plan. And this action plan has great resources uh, that really kind of explain, one, for you all to bookmark. Bookmark this page on your browser and uh, take a look at the offices and services. That is a great directory. And I think in some way, I talked to almost all of these tonight. Um, but if you click on those, you'll see it'll take you to everything to shipping and receiving or to um, facilities, financial aid or basic needs or the Bursar office or everything to say disability programs and resource center. They've got their link uh, to their website, a phone number and an email address that you can correspond with that department. Um, there's also a page uh, for families uh, to help sort of break down um, some of the information and offices and services in a little bit more, uh, say, centralized way. And I'll put that chat uh, right underneath there. Wonderful. Well, you know, I think that that's probably a good place to end the questions sure. on. Um, like I said, I think we could be here for many more hours. And I also just want to remind everyone who's still in the forum that this is the first in a series. So we will be back. We will be back with more information. Um, but yeah. That'll be it for me. Well, I wanted to just end on the note of sincere gratitude and then just highlight uh, that point I made a moment, and well, kind of in the beginning, that we're all in this together um, and challenging and supporting uh, our students uh, to be successful. And But I, I just want to emphasize the fact that still almost 300 people are here tonight uh, speaks to your care, your compassion, and your energy to your students. Uh, and, and that really does mean a lot. I mean, we made my colleagues here, uh, huge thanks to them, but we've made our career in supporting students. So to find families and meet with them in this space uh, doesn't really do the best justice of being in person, but I do have a lot of hope, um, a lot of hope that uh, we will be back together and I'm looking forward to that day. And if you happen to see me in person, uh, please tell me you're at the webinar and, and we could chat and laugh about it a little bit. Um, we need that more than ever, uh, but I want to emphasize to all families, I please uh, be safe and be healthy uh, to go out and vote. Uh, that's coming up soon. Um, and then please contact, uh, and I'll jump to that slide really quick. We, quick, excuse me, we, we left um, a stay in touch page here uh, to, to let us know. I put my email there at the bottom. I believe Nisha's is there too, uh, to contact us if you have any questions. But wishing you and your student the best first week. Uh, go Gators. Have a great rest of the night. Uh, kick your feet up and relax.